Like it or not, there are one million of them roaring across North America's winter landscape, a third of them in Canada. The snowmobile has boomed faster than anything since the outboard motorboat. It's getting bigger, louder, and swifter. Nearly half a million were sold this season. Yet it was a little more than 10 years ago that Armand Bombardier of Valcourt, Quebec, after 25 years of developing tracked snow vehicles, switched the emphasis from work in the snow to fun in the snow, and the boom was on. Production and sales doubled yearly. American companies moved into the field, swallowing up most of the other Canadian producers who had followed Bombardier's lead. 95% of snowmobiles are bought for fun, although they have proved useful in other ways. A Quebec gang used them as getaway vehicles after robbing a bank. But the snowmobile has really made its mark in opening up the winter countryside. Hundreds of miles of woodland trails have been cut by snowmobile clubs, and snowmobilers have had to learn the techniques for riding them. This is the sport that is for the younger ones, uh, not for, for you and I. Uh, maybe on this trail, but not at the speeds that they're trying to uh, obtain as they come down here. Um, this one looks like it's having a little trouble. What sort of speeds do they attain on a trail like this? Well, I would say that he's probably... He's probably going at about 30 or uh, 35 miles an hour uh, at, at that uh, specific point when he passes here. It's, it's rather wide here, a lot wider than it may be in, uh, in some instances. Uh, what about these 150 mile an hour monsters? Uh, well, they're all right for drag racing on a lake in a straight line, but you can't uh, negotiate turns and things with them. So you'll notice, I think, as they come along here, that uh, these these fellows are working, uh, working the machine, working their bodies to keep this thing in. Uh, there's two of them very close here. This this man. Uh, is standing and, and working it like a working it like a, a motorcycle, uh, but uh, you, I don't think he has as much control as the man who was behind him. Not long ago, a summer resort was just that. Nothing much happened in winter. The cottages were locked up after Labor Day, and there was no way of reaching them, even if you wanted to, except on snowshoes. Then came the revolution, the snowmobile revolution. The lakes and woods echoed with the sounds of the two-stroke engine. Not everyone was happy about it, but resort villages like Port Sydney, Ontario, didn't mind at all. Well, your family came here a long time ago. Yes, Gord, we came in 1869, so that's 100 and 101 years. And what has changed in Port Sydney since then? Well, there's been drastic changes. As you can hear the uh, snowmobiles in the background, uh, when I, my great-grandfather came here in 69, uh, there were big trees, much larger than the one behind here, and uh, you can see what's happened today with the snowmobiling and the skiers. Well, uh, this has only been going on for a very few years, is it not out of the 101? Yes, the snowmobiles have been here, I would say, five years in force, uh, very much so in the last two. What effect has it had in the village? Well, it helped, it's helped the economy uh, tremendous, uh, tremendously. How many people uh, live here in the winter and the summer? Well, we have about uh, 200 permanent residents, and in the summertime, we goes up to 800. But in the wintertime, the weekends and so on, I would say our population goes up to probably three or 400. The cottage people coming back. Is this because of the snowmobile bringing them back, or skiing, or what? Uh, yes, yeah, skiing and the snowmobiling, as I said, has uh, broadened the uh, winter sports just a tremendous, and it's a family sport where everybody can get into it, and it's just, I think it's terrific. You can see some of the groups here, uh, how the families are held together with by this. How about it's, the uh, peace of the woods in winter, the forests, the eternal well, stylings and so on? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm afraid the peace of the woods have, uh, you know, has been very, uh, you know, changed, but right now people are getting back in the forests on these old lumber trails. They've never seen it before. You wouldn't uh, get a person that, from a cottage that's ever seen our beautiful back lakes. And uh, I think this is, I think it's just tremendous that people are getting back and, and seeing our forests and uh, our back lakes. It's just beautiful. 
It has brought many of the older people, uh, as you'll see later on, there are many of the uh, 40 and 50 and 60 and even 70 year olds running around and getting out in the fresh air during the winter time where ordinarily they were sitting by the fireside and just uh, content to stay there for the six months of the winter. And uh, the snowmobile has let them go out and, and given them a purpose to go out and enjoy themselves and see many of the things that they couldn't see during the summer. What about road deaths involving snowmobiles? In each case, the snowmobile has gone off his right of way or off the side of the road onto the traveled portion of the highway and thus has got killed. So he has broken the law there and what we feel we need is more and a uh, more and greater uh, let's say, uh, policing of the uh, usable portion of the road so that some of these fellows who are breaking the law are fined and fined a considerable amount of money because I feel that new legislation isn't going to make it any better for us to enforce them or to stop them. If they're breaking the laws now, they're going to continue to break the law. You think then the industry is in a position to police itself? I think it is. Uh, I think that the, the more we educate the uh, snowmobiler, the easier it's going to be. We've had uh, licenses for cars uh, all along. But, uh, and you've had to pass a test to get a driver's license, but it hasn't meant that we stopped uh, accidents and people being, being killed in automobiles. Uh, and I don't think that it is the answer as far as snowmobiles are concerned. Snowmobiles are not welcome on the roads, but there's no generally agreed way to keep them off. Most provinces ban them on highways, although some allow them to cross or use the shoulder of the road. Several are considering licensing snowmobile drivers. The clubs don't agree with this, and they're trying to improve standards of driving themselves. I think most of uh, the people who buy machines don't know uh, what the throttle and what the uh, brake are. Now, uh, Muriel... If you'd like to show us the throttle and the brake on that machine there. That's the throttle and the one on the other is your brake. The brakes are designed to stop you, but not at 60 and 70 miles an hour. And so uh, if you can stay away from uh, those type of speeds on the ice, I think that uh, it's a wise thing. One of the big things for you new people to learn on snowmobiles is... Uh, the snowmobile itself and the controls and, and what the machine can do. It isn't a toy, and you have to feel the machine out. This is one of the safest ways to drive a snowmobile, uh, either with one knee on the machine and your leg up, or sitting back towards the back and moving uh, your torso back and forth from one side of the machine to the other as it uh, tips and tilts to one side. The worst way you can run a snowmobile as far as having control of the machine is to put both knees. Would you like to just demonstrate that for us? Both knees on the machine together. This way you really have no control over the machine because the torso, your torso is so much higher and it's easier for you to uh, manipulate the machine the other way. This way you're allowed to lose it faster than you can control it. I see one of the young lads has just brought your helmet in. Do you always wear a helmet when uh, you're running the machine? You don't always wear it? But when you go into trail rides, you wear it, do you? It's a must, I think, in the club, isn't it? It's a, one of their major rules that they must wear helmets on all trail rides. Naturally, our main concern with the snowmobile at the present time is the killing and the slaughter of people on the roads and the injuries that they're causing. How bad has this been? Well, uh, during uh, the, uh, from January 1969 up to the present time, we've had uh, 26 people killed on snowmobiles throughout the province. Well, is the main trouble a uh, bad operation of the vehicle itself are it coming into collision with a car? Well, it is the bad operation of a vehicle in many, many instances, whereas they don't stay where they're told to stay or where they should stay, and they get onto the highway and they collide with the back end of motor vehicles. And uh, there has been many instances where they've met head-on. Do you think there's any way in which they can be driven safely on roads that are used by cars? Not on the paved travel of the road, no, or, or a portion of the road, because... They are basically 
off-the-road equipment. And we must admit, much to our sorrow at the present time, they've got out of hand. There's a lot of advertising as to the horsepower and, uh, and the different types of snowmobile. And I think a lot of it is dangerous advertising, where you're showing them shooting off the end of cliffs and so on. Uh, I think that just gives the young driver ideas that he'll try the same thing, where a possibly professional man could operate it and operate it in safe, but safely. But uh, it just gives the young operator ideas, and possibly the day will come where tests will have to be uh, uh, provided, and that uh, maybe licenses will be required for uh, people over the age of 16 to operate them throughout our highways in the province. At least 70 people died in snowmobile accidents in Canada last winter, most of them in Ontario and Quebec, where the winter boom was biggest. Some deaths were on the snowmobile's own territory, the lakes and woods, but the great majority occurred on the roads and at night. The wife of the Quebec Minister of Highways was killed on a snowmobile on a highway. Any time a snowmobiler meets a car driver, there's no doubt who's the loser. British Columbia records one death involving impaired snowmobiling and in New Brunswick, a snowmobile collided with a train. Injuries have been many and varied. One casualty was the premier of Prince Edward Island, Alec Campbell, who dislocated his shoulder. The St. John Ambulance Brigade has put seven emergency snowmobile units into the field in Ontario. They tour race meetings and winter carnivals, giving demonstrations. Their chief provincial surgeon, Dr. Leslie Calvert, has made a three-year study of snowmobile accidents. What's the most common type of accident of well, injury? We find the most common ones are ones involving the leg, uh, the extremities in particular, but the leg uh, especially. And one of the features uh, that we found is that they get very bad uh, fractured lower limbs. One of the examples that you might have is somebody sitting on a vehicle such as this and have another vehicle run into him, another snowmobile run into him. They get very bad lower leg fractures and ankle fractures. There's another aspect too, and that is that it's possible, and this happened a few times, to have a limb get caught beneath, between the track and the seat. And one of the recommendations that our organization would have would be that people that are running these, particularly on snow tra trail rides, would learn how to do some of the simple mechanics of taking them apart if they did get one of their members um, involved in an accident of this sort. Uh, is the accident rate abnormally high for this kind of vehicle compared with no, cars, I, for example? No, I, I don't think it's abnormally high, but uh, the thing that worries us is that it's a new uh, type of vehicle, relatively new, and we are getting uh, accidents we never would have gotten if the vehicle hadn't been put on the market. Now, uh, each year, the death ratio is going up. In 19, uh, by the end of 1969, there were only 28 in this province for that snow cruising, snowmobiling year. Uh, this year, already, it's up over 44 in, in the province, and I would see that would say that it probably will go higher. Any advice, doctor, to people when taking up snowmobiling for the first time? Yes, I I would think that first of all they should realize that you don't steer a snowmobile like you steer a car. There's not that much uh, uh, control over the steering, and this is something that they forget. The second thing is that it's a very light vehicle for the speed that it will go, <clears throat> and there's one other bit of advice, and that is if you're driving things at night, you have to know where you're going and have been over the trail before. Uh, one of the great uh, numbers of accidents we've, that we've seen have been to do with eyes and head. And these have taken place very often at night, uh, driving through the woods without uh, uh, goggles on. They end up getting bad eye injuries. <clears throat> the strange thing is that we've even found some of them driving along the side of lakes at night and getting head injuries by hitting diving boards. And so simple things like this that you would never expect to have happened in the wintertime are happening now. And if people would go slower, know where they're going, and uh, just take reasonable precautions, I think the accident ratio would be a way lower. We still have a lot of mavericks uh, who uh, are creating a problem. Uh, they create havoc in bush country like this. Uh, 
uh, areas where uh, trees are being planted, uh, killing themselves because they don't use common sense, and uh, killing seedlings, chasing deer, wild animals that... Uh, it's really not a sport, and this is not why uh, snowmobiling was founded. Uh, the wild animals themselves have enough problems without having somebody chase them, especially deer through deep snow, such as if we stepped off this trail, we'd be into three or four feet. Most of the problems that we have had is the use of the snow machines to uh, chase predators, particularly coyotes and foxes, or they... The operators literally run the animals to exhaustion and then run right over them. And uh, this is pretty brutal, and people really object to this. We're finding that uh, we get complaints, uh, and a considerable number of them, from landowners who violently object to this sort of activity. They don't mind people uh, being reasonable in the use of these machines, but they do object to this utterly cruel uh, so-called sport. We don't... Uh, disagree that this machine can be of benefit in certain conditions like for making uh, access into very remote areas for trapping and to get game harvest in remote areas up in the northern bush country where uh, access is difficult and uh, these machines are excellent for this purpose. Are you planning any kind of uh, new legislation to stop these practices? Yes we are and the uh, legislation will prohibit the uh, chasing and uh, running down of these uh, animals uh, with the use of uh, such vehicles. And this will mean that uh, the uh, hunting privileges uh, will be canceled and uh, there will likely be a minimum fine of uh, about $50. What kind of a maximum fine? Well, it will probably go up to around 200 In the Canadian North, the working snowmobile is taking over from the working dog. In Canada's centennial year, it showed its toughness in a snowmobile drive to the North Pole. In February of this year, this expedition celebrated Manitoba's centennial by taking the mail 600 miles from Pine Falls to Norway House. This took three days. The dog teams used to take ten. This settlement north of Lake Winnipeg is typical of outposts where the snowmobile has replaced not only dogs but cars. You can see them used as a limousine from the airport or a taxi around the settlement. There may be two or three lined up outside the most humble of homes. The Eskimos use great numbers of them. And in the Yukon, they are used on the roads and licensed like cars. With the snowmobile traffic comes the snowmobile cop with his snowmobile traffic ticket. The RCMP rides these vehicles, and both the Quebec and Ontario provincial forces have snowmobile squads of their own. Constable Fourchette, since the formation of the Quebec Provincial Police Snowmobile Squad, has uh, this squad in effect uh, cut down on the number of fatal accidents in Quebec over the last couple of years? Oh yes, last year we had about over 30 deaths during the year. And uh, this year... Just during the winter? Just during the winters, yeah. And uh, this year we have about the same thing. And uh, there's twice uh, mother, uh, ski doos or snowmobile in the province. So, Twice as many as last year. That's it. That's it. And uh, this year we have just over 30 deaths. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we do, you, uh, normally we come down and patrol with the uh, uh, snowmobiles, trails, and competition. And when they see us, if they don't have any plates or, uh, or they don't stay there, they go back home, see? And uh, if they don't have the place, well, we give them the warning, a 48 hours uh, warning. And uh, if they go on the road, well, we have to give them a ticket like a car. Is there an age limit uh, on, the, on, the, on the use of a snowmobile? I mean, do you have to be a certain age before you can use it? I've seen some kids around here looked about uh, six or seven years old, yet they were driving a snowmobile. No, there is no law yet, but uh, as long as they can hold the, the snowmobile, they can drive. But uh, later on, maybe they're, they're going to be an average. But uh, this year, we don't have any. As long as they can drive the, the, the snowmobile. Because uh, that, those, some of those machines are just a little bit too tough for even a guy like you or oh, yes. uh, like me to handle. They're oh, a little yeah. too much. Sure. Well, Staff for Shet, how serious would uh, an infraction on a snowmobile have to be before you would have to arrest the driver? 
Well, if they make a careless driving, some guy, and they go in the, in the field and they try to make an accident with the other snowmobile, well, we see a, we, we take the, the snowmobile out of the, the field, take it in the garage or something, like, a place like that, and uh, we give them a ticket. So we developed a bit of a program back in the early 60s following a rash of break-ins in the summer cottage area up, near, up at uh, Lake Nipissing. And uh, we had no snow vehicles at the time, as we call them. And uh, that one winter, we rented one, and we put it into this area where the year before we had been plagued by cottage break-ins, buildings which are not used, as you know, during the fall, winter, and spring. And uh, that year, with some persistent patrolling, afternoons and evenings and weekends, and generally letting uh, anybody know who was interested in committing this kind of crime in relation to these cottages, that the police were patrolling there, something like we patrol out in the highways or around business premises. We didn't have a break in that year, not one. Um, we think it's had a salutary effect on uh, damage and break-ins to cottages in some areas. We've been able to hold it down uh, to a reasonable figure. We found them quite a little advantage in the uh, in the snow areas of Ontario, and that's, that uh, holds good for uh, the south, central, as well as the northern regions as well. We've had a number of rescues that uh, we're quite happy about. Uh, we were able to get in and uh, bring out people who had been injured. The uh, weather had closed in and the uh, search and rescue helicopters weren't available. And the snow cruiser was able to run back in 30, 40, 50, 60 miles and bring these people out and, and save, perhaps save their lives. The next race, 400 cc stop. Men, this is the one we've been waiting for. Let's have all these hot waters out here and let's get into this 400 cc stop. Snowmobile is noisy and never more so than at a race. Manufacturers agree the noise level must come down, but they haven't done it yet. Racing has grown with professionals on big machines competing for prizes of up to $3,000. Well, what is the knack to it, to racing? What do you have to... Well, uh, there's a lot of skill involved, and I think a lot of it's uh, setting up your own machine to, to win. You have to work on it constantly to keep it in good shape and modify it uh, as far as you can with your own knowledge and get the last mile an hour out of it if possible. You just did, what, 90-something... No, this I morning did, and these I did 87.6, I think it was, wasn't it, Ken? Right. Yeah. Is that about as fast as a snowmobile can go? No, I think even Rick will agree there's quite a bit more potential. There's so many things that have to be taken into consideration. The surface, uh, this is one of the best services we've had all winter. What about bigger machines? Have you driven bigger ones than these today? Uh, Rick could answer that one better uh, from a factory rep, uh, factory driver's point of view. Well, uh, there are bigger ones, especially made for land speed records. We don't have any here. We built one last week to run this land speed. We haven't got it quite down. We figure we can touch over 90 with it. But uh, down in the States and out west, there are bigger ones, and maybe next year we'll have bigger ones here. Snowmobile racing is uh, very definitely a different breed of people than domestic snowmobiling as you refer to. It's the same as in cars. There are people who will go for a Sunday drive, and there's other people who will work to modify their cars to race them. It's the sport uh, more than anything, and I think money is more. Money and fame is secondary. We recognize in racing the a higher need for safety standards than perhaps in regular racing. Uh, the machinery is much faster, much more powerful. But on the other hand, the drivers are much more skillful and a lot more knowledgeable. We lay down very strong and very strict safety standards drivers that don't abide by them just aren't allowed to race on the circuit. As in most motorsports, we've had our accidents, we've had our broken bones, we've had no fatalities, and we've had no real serious injuries whereby an individual has been crippled. And driving, uh, Rick, as an expert, what would you advise somebody who's taking up the snowmobile for the first time? Well, I think as, as in anything common sense, I'd love to do it. Just uh, don't go beyond your ability, you know, choose a machine that suits you. If you're a family rider, choose a small machine. Don't go for a big high-powered machine as your first machine. Start with something small and then work up from there. The sporty type of individual who rides these machines um, has asked for more power 
and we almost had to give him more power because he wanted more accessories. He wanted more uh, weight put on these machines. And in order to contract this, this weight, we had to get more horsepower. But I believe you may find a, uh, a change coming up uh, very shortly, and perhaps this coming season, where um, there will be less accessories on these machines, less fringes on these machines, um, with less horsepower, but will they, they'll accomplish just as much. You see, I think the, uh, the people now have had a taste of what they wanted. We have seen this fast growth and this peaking up, but now you will find that instead of increasing 100% per year or doubling up every year, um, we will come to a sort of a leveling off point. When? Well, this could happen in two years or in three years from now. This word sporty you used a few moments ago, is that the key to that little machine? I believe it is. Um, because it is a, a fun machine. And uh, you feel sort of uh, younger when you get on one of these machines. And you feel you want to uh, relive your life all over again because you're out in the open air and, the, and away from uh, the smog of the large cities. and. Uh, it's a different life all It's a new way of life.